Welcome everyone to the very first Xamarin Show. I'm James Montemagna, I'm a principal PM on the Xamarin team here at Microsoft, and if you've been watching Channel 9 at all, you've probably seen my face on some amazing shows such as Visual Studio Toolbox, and some amazing conferences like Build and Ignite and Xamarin Evolve. I've been doing Xamarin cross-platform mobile development for the last five years. I worked at a small startup first, building apps all the way from scratch on iOS, Android, and Windows. Then I joined Xamarin three years ago as a developer evangelist, and now I'm here at Microsoft. I'm super excited that we have the Xamarin Show. It's going to be your one-stop shopping for everything Xamarin. And I first want to take a little bit of time before we dive into our topic to talk about what is the Xamarin Show and who am I, if you don't know uh, who James is. Well, first off, the Xamarin Show is going to be a weekly show, anywhere between 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes, depending on how uh, crazy we get, sometimes by myself or sometimes with a guest. And we're going to be covering all sorts of topics in the Xamarin ecosystem. Sometimes, like today, we'll be top, uh, tackling a specific topic. Today's topic is going to be code sharing across the different platforms. Uh, but we may be talking something very specific, like map integration on iOS or on Android, or a new feature of iOS 10 or Android N. But also, we want to have people that are building apps, developers building apps, come onto the Xamarin Show, tell us about the apps and challenges that they face in cross-platform mobile development, and show what they've been building. Also, we're releasing a lot, and iOS, Android, and of course, the Windows ecosystem is evolving too. So when we come out with a new release, the Xamarin Show is going to be there right for you with all the brand new features that you can take advantage of. Sometimes we'll have guests on talking about integrations that they're doing with Xamarin, maybe for Azure or for Office 365, or maybe, who knows, anyone else that wants to come on and talk about some awesome libraries that they're building for cross-platform mobile development. So that's going to be the Xamarin Show. Every single week, everything that you need to build awesome apps across iOS, Android, and Windows in C Sharp with Xamarin. Now, like I said, I'm James Montemagno. I've been building apps for a long time with Xamarin. And my goal and my dream and my passion is that everyone builds apps in C Sharp natively across all the different platforms with Xamarin. And I love it. And that's why I'm so excited to be hosting the Xamarin Show. Now, like I said, we're going to be talking about some really awesome topics. So whether you're brand new to actually cross-platform mobile development with Xamarin, or maybe you're like me and have been doing Xamarin development for five years, there's going to be something for you. Now, in today's episode, we're going to take a look at how exactly do you share code across all these different platforms? How do you take that code that was written here on iOS with Xamarin and move it to Android or move it to Windows? Because there's a lot of different code sharing techniques and what I want to do is cover with you uh, a few of them, when you would use some and when you wouldn't use some, and what's the best for your application. Now, normally, I wouldn't have a lot of slides. That's my goal is to go really deep into code and just walk through building out some applications or, or tying into some cool SDKs when I have guests on the show. Uh, but today, we're going to have a few slides to kind of cover the high-level topics. And what I've loved about Xamarin is that we can take our C-sharp code and put it to every single mobile device in the entire world. Whether it's iOS, Android, things like Android TV, Apple TV with tvOS, or maybe Google Glass or the new wearables for watchOS, or even Android Wear. But of course, you are building apps across these different platforms, and like I said, you want to share code. So if you think about how Xamarin works under the hood, is that we enable you to build a shared C-sharp business layer logic to your applications. So this is going to be all of your core business logic, so your models, view models, RESTful service calls, SQL databases, Azure integrations. This is just pure .NET C-sharp code that can be run. And then you build out a native UI for iOS, Android, and of course, Windows. What's great here is that it compiles onto a beautiful native application, and it's super high performance. So you're getting that beautiful user interface with 100% API access, native performance, and you're sharing a vast amount of code. Now what's really cool is if you architect with some of the patterns that we're going to kind of cover today, you can even share some of that code with your back end. Maybe it's a C-sharp server you know, uh, code that you want to run on Azure, or maybe with the core CLR, or .NET Core, ASP.NET Core. You can actually build and share some code across the different platforms, because everything's in C-sharp. So let's actually step through uh, an application. And first, I'm just going to go ahead and jump out to my desktop. And we're going to take a look at an application that I've been building, just kind of give you the, the, the highlights here. Now, this application uh, I'm building right inside of Visual Studio 2015. Uh, and if we take a look 
uh, here, I built my iOS application first. Some Xamarin developers like to build all three at the same time, or maybe just build one and then go to the different platforms. So here I have my coffee app.ios. If you know anything about me, I love coffee. It's what I do. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Uh, and what I wanted to do is go out and uh, pull some of my favorite coffee shops from Azure so I could kind of keep this, this table of Azure data. Uh, here and just load it into a map and then easily add some new locations and then I could fix it up later. So here's all of my code, all of my UI logic and all of my business logic is here inside this application. So inside of my references, I have my Azure Mobile Apps backend, I have JSON.NET, I have my local SQLite uh, to store my data, I have some system, some .NET namespaces that are in here for HTTP and core and XML and Xamarin iOS, for instance, is going to give me all my iOS uh, namespaces that I need. And then down here I have my core logic. So I have, what is a coffee? Well, a coffee is a name, latitude and longitude, very, very simple. I have a, some distance utils, so these are going to do some conversions, miles to latitude degrees and miles to longitude degrees, so I can just say, hey, you know, zoom a camera in so close in miles. And then the core of my application is this coffee's view model. So my coffee's view model is, is using uh, this Azure mobile apps SDK to go up to Azure, go to motscoffee.azurewebsites.net, pull down my coffee table, and then load it in, and I can easily add new items right in there. So pretty, pretty straightforward. This is just .NET code. But the core of it here is my iOS application. So here is my main storyboard right here. I just have a map and I have some buttons. And you can see this is our iOS storyboard designer right inside of Visual Studio. If I had some toolboxes and if I wanted to drag and drop some buttons around, I could add more buttons. And I could see what this is going to look like on different devices. We kind of get this generic view. So I have two buttons and then I have a map view. And I could say, oh, what is it going to look like on a 5 or 5S? You know, what is it going to look like on a 6S? And make sure all my constraints are set up. So here I can actually say I have these constraints in here that, that when the, the actual device moves to and from, it actually is going to readjust for me. I like to, to make everything in this generic view. Uh, now here, when I actually tap on some of these elements, I can take a look at all the properties. So here I just have load data, and then I have different buttons that are in here uh, in different colors. So what I want to do is be able to move this map around, load some data, so I can take a look at the code behind for this view controller. So I'll double tap on that. And this view controller, there's not that much code actually in the code behind of the user interface. What I first did is I have all this logic right inside my iOS application, and I have a coffee's view model. Whenever I actually tap that load button, it's going to go out. It's going to remove any of the annotations or little pins that are on the map. And then it's going to go and load all my coffees from my view model asynchronously and then make some annotations on the map. And when I first load my app, it's going to load and zoom to Seattle. So here I use some of those coordinate utils. And then um, when I want to add a pin, I go and I simply use my geocoder, do a reverse geolocation lookup to actually pull and place the pin. So let's run this application so we can see it. So here on the very top of my toolbar, I actually saw I had an iPhone 5S uh, simulator there. And this is going to load our iOS simulator for Windows. If you saw, I have my nice MacBook that was sitting next to me in rose gold. So here my, my Surface Book is connected uh, over to my actual uh, Mac. So it's communicating that way. And this is our iOS simulator for Windows. So here I can go ahead and, and pinch to zoom in. Here's Seattle. For instance, I'm just going to go ahead and hit load data. This is going to go off and it loaded all my data from my Azure backend. So I can go ahead and tap on one of these pins. And there's Vivace. Uh, here's more coffee shop. One of my favorites is actually Milstead & Co. up in Fremont. And I can actually go around and do this. I could actually uh, do, uh, see all the coffee shops and maybe I want to drop a pin. I add a new pin and I actually have a new location. So I'm kind of doing two things here. I'm interacting with the map. I'm pulling data down from Azure. And I'm doing some geolocation uh, lookup for this application. But all of this code is stuck inside of my iOS application right now. If we took a look, we saw the logic, the coffee view model distance. And, and there's actually a lot of logic in the click handlers here. So I have a lot of logic to go off, get the coffees, put it on a pin, 
uh, enable and disable controls, and then even to zoom to certain locations. It would be a lot nicer if I could share some of this code if I want to, say, take it to iOS and Android. So what I've done over here is I've gone ahead and I've just created an Android application. And inside of there, I have some resources, layouts, and controls. I've added the same NuGet packages that I did over for my iOS application, but I have some Google Play services uh, to use Maps. So if I actually go in and take a look at the, the layout and the main layout here, this is going to load our uh, Android designer right inside of Visual Studio. So we'll give this a second to load up, and we're going to see a very similar user interface. I have load coffee and add pin, and then I have a fragment. If we take a look at the uh, code behind here, essentially Android user interfaces are built with Android XML. So we have a linear layout, we have two buttons, and then I have a fragment, which is going to be my map fragment. So let's say we want to actually share some of this code. What are the strategies that I could utilize today to take this code from iOS and put it over onto Android? So when developers are looking to share this code, the first place that we actually point them to is to portable class libraries. And I want to talk a little bit about portable class libraries, because uh, what it is, it's essentially a class library. We've been building .NET, c -sharp applications for a long time, so you're probably familiar with class libraries. Essentially, I say, oh, I want to create a new Android class library and have all of the .NET and all the Android stuff inside of this class library. But you can't take an Android class library and pull it into an iOS application. Because it's going to have all the Android stuff in it. Similarly, if you created just a .NET 4.5 application, it may or may not be compatible with other platforms because they may not have all of .NET. So what a portable class library does, it says, hey, let's take all of the platforms that implement .NET. So, you know, Windows 8, 10, Phone Silverlight, Phone 8.1, Android and iOS with Xamarin, they all implement and they all have a .NET runtime, whether it's a uh, .NET runtime, mono runtime, or a .NET core. There's a .NET runtime somewhere. So, what it does, it does this intersection. And we kind of visualize this here, and I did my best to kind of visualize it. And in portable class libraries, I like to call them portable profile libraries. So, you can think of it that when you have this intersection, the more checkboxes you check, the smaller that profile becomes. So we can see here that profile 7 is the largest because it's only targeting you know, Windows 10, iOS, and Android. But when I add in Phone Silverlight, it gets a little bit smaller. When I add in uh, Phone RT and Silverlight and Store and iOS and Android, it even gets smaller to for the profile 259. So this is an interesting approach because if you only need to support a few platforms, you'll get a lot more of the API available to you right from the start. But if you need to do all platforms, you're going to be kind of have a smaller .NET intersection there. So kind of very be aware of what's happening there. So in this instance, we'll actually start and create a portable class library. And this is where a lot of developers go because you can only write .NET code. You know it's going to work on these different platforms. So let's actually take a look here. I'm going to come in to this application, and I'm going to right-click on the solution and say, Add New Project. So this will spin up the dialog, and under Visual C Sharp, you'll see Class Library Portable for iOS, Android, and Windows. We can also see when I have Xamarin installed, I have Android, Apple Watch, iPad. So if I just wanted to create just a class library, I could. But under Visual C Sharp, you'll see Portable for iOS, Android, and Windows. Let me call this coffeeapp.portable. It's a good name. And that will go ahead and add a brand new library for me. Now, we'll delete that class one because we don't need it. So we'll delete that. And let's take a look at some of these properties. When I right click on the portable class library, we can see right away that it's supporting uh, Windows 8, including 8 Universal, or Windows 10 Universal, .NET 4.5. Uh, ASP.NET, Phone 8.1, Android, and iOS. So it kind of has everything I need. So I have some code inside of here in this logic folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply drag and drop that over. And we're going to delete that from our iOS application. It's gone. Because everything is going to be inside of this shared code. So here's my actual new coffeeapp.logic. And we'll see Visual Studio gets very upset at me 
because it doesn't have this app service helper for this entity data. And if I go into my coffee's view model, it's not going to have any of these because I haven't installed the NuGet packages that I'm using in my other applications. So let's do that first. So I'm going to go in and say manage NuGet packages. And we'll go to installed. And I did it on the solution level because that will show me everything that's installed across all the different platforms. So here, for instance, we'll get rid of that bubble. There we go. We can first install our Azure mobile client. So we can see it's installed into Android and iOS. So we'll say install. It will actually go out and try to find any dependencies that it needs. So it'll probably pull from my local cache first. So there we go. It'll install some other required um, licenses here. So it's going to depend on net HTTP and the BCL. So we'll pull that in. There we go. It's updated. Now it's installed. We're also going to install the SQLite store just so it's there. I'll pull that in. So our Azure mobile client allows us to connect to an Azure backend. Uh, there we go. Uh, easily. And also do online offline data synchronization. And I'm going to use this library called App Service Helpers that some of my colleagues, Mike James and Pierce, built. and allows you to easily just get to that code, um, just a few lines of code to pull down data. So there we go. So we pull that in. Now we can see what else actually has been installed. So JSON.NET was installed because it was a dependency. The SQLite PCL was installed for me automatically. And any of the Android actual NuGet, such as support and the Google Play services and the maps, were only installed inside of my Android project. So there's no need to install those. In fact, if I tried to, it wouldn't let me because it's Android specific. All of these other libraries that I've actually added are built against a portable class library or some implementation of it. So it allows me to pull it in. So now, when I come back into my application, into my portable class library, you can see it's very happy. Right here, I have my iData store, I have my coffees uh, here, I can get my coffees, everything is ready to be used. If I go into here, we can see, boom, it's found the app service helpers.models. If we go underneath our references, let me go ahead and zoom in here, we can see that. It's not going to show me all of the actual system dot, system dot, system dot that were pulled in. It's only going to show me this dot net, which is that intersection. And then it's going to show me that I have my Windows Azure, I have my SQL, all the stuff that I pulled down from uh, dot net, or from the NuGet. So now, if I go ahead and build this, build it up, just the portable class library, we should see build successful. So it's good. Now, I deleted that code from iOS. So we don't want to break it because if I go to recompile, it's going to be upset. So I'll go into Add Reference. I'll add that portable here and hit OK. Perfect. Now, if I want to, I can go ahead and build up my iOS application again. This will now recompile all the code, not only for my portable class library, but also for the actual iOS application. And then I could deploy it. It would continue to work because it's just the same exact application code. I didn't change anything. I haven't pulled out any of the logic that was there for iOS at all. It's just going to pull in. And since the namespaces are the same, it's just going to relaunch, deploy, and it's going to be my same application that was there. So if I go off, here's my map. I can load the data. It's going to go off into my portable class library and actually pull in all of my coffee shops that are here. Pretty awesome. So now we can do this for Android. So we saw earlier that I added that reference to my iOS application. So now I'm going to add the portable class library into my Android application. There we go. Now once I've done that, I can come into the code behind for that Android application. And let me just go ahead and run it so we can see and actually build up some of this here. So I'm going to set the Android project as my startup. And when I do that, it switches over to debug any CPU. You could also see there's iPhone and iPhone simulator. So if I was deploying to iPhone, it would, it would actually find all the iPhones or iPhone simulators on my Mac. It's any CPU. And then with that, my Android emulators come up or a physical Android device. And I actually have a Nexus 6 here that I'll be deploying on. I like to use physical devices when I'm interacting with Maps and Maps APIs just because it has all the actual sensor data there. Uh, else I could use an emulator uh, like our Visual Studio emulators for Android. So here's my, my emulator there. And let's just go ahead and deploy this. So I'm going to go ahead and launch it. I haven't actually tapped into the shared code yet, and that's what I want to do next. So it's going to build up my Android application, and it's going to deploy it 
uh, onto my Android device. And I'm using a little screen sharing application for my Android device called Visor, uh, which is awesome. Uh, that will actually enable me to show everyone here uh, my screen. So it's a deploy, and I'll start a debug session uh, over on my Android device. So there we go. Here's my coffee app. Got some nice material design. I zoom over to Seattle. And now if I just say load coffee, it doesn't actually do anything. Just for fun, I started kind of mocking out my user interface. And this is how I actually take my approach to mobile development is I start to kind of just add some functionality uh, and then get ready to implement the shared code. So here I'm just kind of adding pins, but it's not going off to Azure and doing any hard work. So let's do that. Inside my main activity, that's the code behind for this screen. So here's the two buttons, button load coffee, button add pin. And I can come into my main activity, and we can see how I'm setting up this application today. I go off, and of course I had already pulled in my Azure mobile apps SDK, so I initialize it here. I say, hey, make sure you load that main storyboard, or that main Android XML that we saw. Then I just do a little bit of work to get the map, get my buttons, and load my map. You can see I have two click handlers here to add a pin and load coffee. So let's see what it's doing. Right here, when I load my coffee, it clears the map, and then uh, it goes and it adds a generic marker to the center position. It says it's Seattle. So not great, but it's ready, as you can see, for some code. And then when I add a pin, I actually do a, another reverse geolocation, but using the Android APIs uh, inside of there. And then I go and get the title, and I add a map pin. And below, we can see that I actually just do some zooming to Seattle. So it's pretty, pretty nice. Nothing too crazy. So let's go ahead and actually access some of the shared code. So here up top, we can see I'm using System Link, the Android APIs. I can say using coffeeapp.logic. So I've pulled in that portable class library. I have that logic here. And you can see I haven't used any of it yet. So let's go ahead and create our first coffee, coffee's view model. There's our view model. The very first thing I'll do underneath when I initialize my application, I'll say, I'll say view model equals new coffee's view model. So I've initialized my mobile apps. When I go and initialize this view model, it's going to create and connect up to this website. That's here. Perfect. So now we can actually start creating this application. So we want to do uh, one thing first, which is tie into the shared code, this immense amount of shared code for this coffee. So we can see it's kind of ready. So there's some items. And we'll say, hey, you know, let's go ahead and say await view model. Whenever I tap load, I'm going to say get coffees. Perfect. Now here, I'll loop through all of these. And I'm going to copy this code, except for I don't need this location anymore. I'm going to go ahead and copy through this code. And we're going to create new pins for each one of these. There we go. So I create a new marker option, which is an Android API. I go ahead and set the position, and I set the actual title. Now, this item, though, is the actual coffee that's coming back. So we can see the Azure version, the latitude, the longitude that's in here. So I'm just going to replace location with item. So that'll be my coffee. And then instead of saying it's Seattle, I'll just say item.name. There we go. Now, what's really nice about this is that there's only a few lines of code in my actual code behind to put those pins on the map. What's really nice is that this get coffees that is shared between now iOS and Android is doing all the heavy lifting. So it's creating my easy table. It's going out getting items. If I had to do sorting, if I had to do filtering, I could do it all in my shared code. So just with that one exact uh, API, I can go ahead and relaunch this Android application onto my actual device. So it's going to now recompile everything up. And we could actually go and add some breakpoints here. So we could come in. And here's our Android application again. It's zoomed into Seattle. And I'm going to say load coffee. We're in a debug session on a real device. So it's going to hop back over into Visual Studio. And I put it after the get coffee. So here, for instance, I can see that it is a mobile service, result enumerable. I can continue on. We can see our first item here is a cup of coffee. It's Monorail Espresso, which to me is the best coffee shop in all of Seattle. That's just me. I absolutely love it. And the latitude and longitude. So now I could go ahead and continue on. If I hop back over, I have all my coffee shops over in Seattle, all pulled 
from Azure and synchronized doing online offline data synchronization. So if I change something in Azure, if I change some code, it'll be put there, automatically pulled down. Now that's pretty cool. Now I also did a little bit of more logic in my shared code. So I didn't just have the ability to add uh, location or to load locations. I also added the ability to add and save data up into my Azure portal. So here now what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to reuse that view model. Whenever I add a pin, not only go and do a reverse geolocation lookup, but hey, also go out and based on the current location, let's do this. View model will await view model dot add coffee. So this add coffee is going to go out. Let's take a look at it. Again, this is in the shared code. It's going to take in a name, a latitude, and longitude. And it's going to add the new coffee into our actual database. So here we go. I can say add coffee. And I'm say, OK, so for this one, we have a title here that I pulled down. And I have a location.latitude and a location.longitude. There we go. So it'll go off and it'll add that to my Azure backend. So again, any of the platform specific logic here is not going to be shared, obviously, because I can't access that from my portable class library. I can't go in and add a new Android namespace in there because it's just .NET code. But adding this and synchronizing it all up with Azure is all going to be shared. So let's launch this again. Here we go. So now I have my coffee application zoomed into Seattle. We'll load the coffees up. We have all of our coffee there. We can move around. I'm going to say add pin. And when I do that, it's going to go ahead and say this is on East Cherry Street. There's actually a Cherry Street coffee, so that's pretty convenient. Now what's cool is that I can go ahead and launch the same application over on iOS. And I haven't added that logic just yet to actually add the, a new location, but I can say load data. And if everything is working correctly, there's that same exact pin that was sent up to Azure and pulled down. And all from the shared code, right? So they're sharing that same logic. So if I need to actually adjust what's happening in that backend code, it'll automatically reflect and update the application on iOS and Android. I only have to fix the code in one spot. So that's really convenient. That's really one nice way of sharing code across all the different platforms. Now, you may be saying, well, James, what if I just want to uh, access some of that code? You know, it would be nice if I had a single API to do geolocation, reverse geolocation lookups. Uh, well, in that instance, we can't go into our shared code here. If I, if I had an API and actually put a name here, get, location, get name for location, I can't go in and say, if I stop debugging and say, you know what, uh, there's an Android API to do this thing. I can't get it. I can't get access to it. There's no .NET API to give that to me, so I can't have access to it here because it's actually using hardware-specific functionality of the location on the devices. And there's a few ways to get around that. If you're using portable class libraries, you would create some sort of interface and then implement that on each platform and use some sort of service locator to actually new it up. So you'd have an interface that you would access from shared code. Now, a lot of developers have been coming up to me recently and they say, hey, we've been using portable class libraries for a long time. You know, these profile things, they're, they're sometimes getting in your way, but they are a nice way of sharing code and creating libraries. But what is this new thing called .NET Core? <laughs> Everyone may be, have maybe heard of it recently. Uh, .NET Core is a product uh, here from Microsoft, and essentially it's .NET running across, I, or for, across Windows, Linux, and Mac. It's a .NET runtime. Uh, that's super fast, runs cross-platform, it's open source, uh, and it's uh, set against a set of APIs that have been implemented for .NET. So it's very convenient if you're writing an, a .NET application that needs to run on the different platforms. Now in the Xamarin world, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been writing cross-platform apps that have run on Mac and run on Linux, because Mono, our .NET runtime, runs everywhere. Now what's important is how .NET core works. It's a .NET runtime that, that works, but what's really important for sharing code is if you're creating a .NET core application, .NET core implements something called net standard. And you can think of it like this. Uh, just like portable class libraries were a subset of what's already available on .NET on those different platforms, .NET standard libraries is a contract of APIs that says some .NET runtime has implemented these APIs for me. 
So that means it'll just work a .NET standard library, will just work on .NET Framework, .NET Core, including ASP.NET Core, uh, Xamarin applications, whether they're for Mac OS or iOS or Android, and in the future, Unity, with the Unity engine to be powered with .NET standard libraries. So in the world of portable class libraries, when you didn't have access to some of those APIs because there's this intersection, .NET standard comes in to say, listen, we're going to create API contracts. So it's not an intersection. It is something that has been implemented on each platform and we know will work when you actually use this library. So for instance, we can see all the platforms here on the left-hand side. So net standard on top, which is going to be the alias and the different versions. Today there's a version 1.0 to 1.6. And anything below it are the different platforms that have a .NET runtime that implement these standards. So what you can see here is that the very first three, .NET Core and .NET Framework uh, 4.6.3, for instance, and Mono and Xamarin platforms all implement all the features of 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6. And as you start to go back to other platforms, you kind of lose some of the, the APIs that were implemented in these different platforms. So if you're creating a Windows 10 universal app or you're building a library that wants to be consumed on these different platforms, you would go and you would create a 1.4 and say, I want to support Xamarin apps, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, .NET Framework 4.6.1, uh, and then Windows 10. And, and I would create a 1.4. The nice thing is that 1.4 libraries can consume 1.0, 1.2, 1.3, for instance. If you're creating a 1.1, you can only consume 1.1. So if you still had to target Windows Phone Silverlight, you could. When I talk about those APIs, it's a contract. So we can see it's all documented on the .NET standard GitHub page where you can find this. Uh, we'll have links in the show notes that you can see what APIs, what namespaces were implemented in each version. So for instance, 1.6 includes Win32 primitives, and that was added in 1.3, so it continues to implement it there in different versions that have occurred. So 1.3 here implements system.collections 4.0.10, where 1.2 is 4.00. So you can actually get a high-level overview of what's implemented there. So you may actually want to use .NET uh, standard libraries when sharing code across applications, but really, when you want to share a central .NET library and distribute it for anyone to consume. So let's jump back into code and see how I could port this over. So if I go and say add a new project, I could see that there's .NET Core. And there's a .NET Core class library. And that's not exactly what we want to do because that would be creating a class library for .NET Core. And .NET Core implements more than the .NET standard. Uh, actually, but the net standard is what's implemented on all platforms. So I'm actually going to go back and create a new portable class library. It's going to sound a little weird. This is what we do today. This may change in the future. But I'm going to create a portable class library. And just like before, I'm going to come in and say properties. And what's been added is a button underneath the profiles to say, let's switch this over from a profile based class portable library to a standard, a net standard portable library. So when I do that, it's going to go and switch it over. And now we can see it's selected the different versions of .NET standard available to me. So if I wanted to, I could take a look and there's a project.json which says, hey, this is using this .NET standard library. This is the framework. So NuGet will know what to consume. And there's, there is some backwards compatibility layer there. But I can come in and if I wanted to, I could say, hey, you know what? Let's make this a, a 1.4. I'll change it there. It's going to reload it. Now I have a new API to target again. So I could come in. I could say, hey, what's available? Here's system, um, uh, system.io, for instance. And if I wanted to, I could create a file stream. Here's my stream. And I could go off to the races and build this one library. I could pull that code over. I could consume some nougats if I needed to. For instance, if I wanted to, I wanted to say, hey, you know what? I want to now consume a package here. I could browse the internet and I could say, hey, let me see, can I consume AutoMapper? And what we can see down here is that there's a net standard version of it and it implements it so I can install AutoMapper into this actual library. So it's a go off and it'll find all the different actual um, other NuGet packages that are required for this to work. And it'll install all of 
auto mapper for me. And now we can see up here, I have my NuGet of auto mapper. Boom, done. So if I wanted to, I could come and start using auto mapper. And what's nice here is I could come into my Android application, add a reference, and sure enough, I could add that class library right there. So if you wanted to get started, .NET Core and the .NET standard libraries are newer, where portable class libraries have been around for a while. So there's kind of these different ways of sharing this code. So those are two approaches, and I said there was three. <laughs> so I said there was a third. So what is the third, you may be saying, James? That's a great question. So the third way is kind of the easiest, drop-dead, simple way of sharing code. And what's really unique about this approach is that it enables you to no longer be restricted to the actual subset of .NET, or even what .NET standard implements. The idea here is that I have just a file of code. So when I have a code file, I don't care what's in it. It is some c -sharp .NET code, and I just want to simply include it automatically into all of my applications. That's what I would like to do. That would be my goal and my dream. So it would also be nice at the same time to say, well, what if I do want to write some iOS or Android application logic in there? Can I do that? That would be pretty nifty. Uh, and that's where shared libraries comes in. And I have one slide here to kind of demonstrate what a shared asset project and library is. So here, for instance, I have a shared code library, shared asset project. It's, it's signified here with the double diamond arrow, and it just has some files in it. And what's interesting is that it doesn't have any references, but it's still added as a reference to my iOS or my Android applications. What's interesting here is that it ties in directly into Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio on a Mac to enable you to do this cross-platform. And you can actually conditionally compile different logic in here. So for instance, I can switch between what do I actually want to code against right now? Do I want to code against the Android project or the iOS project? And then if I want to, I can use a conditional compilation flag to say this is only for iOS. So let's do that. Let's jump back over and actually rewrite this application now with a shared project. So I'm going to come in, and I want to actually leverage this. And I'll show you what's kind of nice about this. So I'm going to say Add New Project, and I'm just going to search for Shared. There we go. And when I do, under Visual C Sharp, you'll see Shared Project. So I'm going to say coffeeapp.shared and add it in. And there's nothing in here. If I actually look, there is literally nothing in there. So what I can do is I can say, I want to copy all that logic in there. There we go. There's my logic. And I'm actually going to go ahead and delete all my portable class libraries. Delete. Gone. I want to go ahead and delete this net standard one. Gone. Perfect. Now what's really cool is I can still add that shared project as there's a shared project here as a reference. Add it in. There's my coffee app.shared. And I can do the same thing here for Android. So here we go. Here's Android. Shared. Super cool. Nice. Now check this out. When I come back over into this actual logic here, we can go ahead and compile up this application again for iOS or Android. And notice that I didn't actually, uh, let me go to iPhone simulator, there we go. I didn't actually add any references or any NuGet packages into my shared code project. What happens is that it's automatically picked up that this was included in iOS or Android. If I compile my Android application, we're actually going to see that the shared code will actually have a dropdown for iOS and Android. So let's close some of these files and we'll re-upload some, uh, or add some new stuff in here. So what's nice here is I, I recompile, I have all that logic in there. If I came into my, into my view controller here, we can see it's Coffee's view, view model. It has everything that I need. So my view controller has reference automatically. So what if, for instance, I came into my Coffee's view model. Down here, I can have my iOS application. And what would be really cool is if I came up and said, you know what would be cool is I have all this logic for Azure, but what if I was able to pass in a latitude and longitude uh, and actually get the name back? 
And at the same time, what if I uh, actually not only returned the name, but added the coffee automatically? That'd be pretty cool. So let's take some of this logic out of iOS. So I'm going to go into my view controller. Whenever I tap to add that button, what would be nice is if I didn't have to do all this logic. So I'm parsing all of this data inside of here. So if I just came in, I said, I'm going to copy this code. I'm going to put it right in there. And we're going to see here, I can actually start using core location. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting because I don't want that to run on Android. So I'm going to say if underscore underscore iOS use core location, l if underscore underscore Android, and if. So I can actually write any of my iOS logic here and then any of my Android logic there. So check this out. So now I can say, oh, I need to get this stuff here. I don't have the center, but I do. I've passed in the latitude and I've passed in the longitude. So I can get my locations. And I know that I could var get the name and I could pull this other code out of here, which is going to be here. Get this out of here. There we go. Get that there. There's my name. And at some point, I'm going to return name out of there. And we can see it's going to need a some more references to system link. That's fine. Everyone will use link. And I'm using my iOS code here. And again, I'm going to go ahead and preface this with an if iOS. Let's go ahead and return that. L if Android. So I could write Android logic there. And if. There we go. Because this is actual platform specific logic inside of my shared code. So I could come in, pull this in here, and it'll return the actual location here. So now, back in my shared code, if I need to actually adjust that name, I don't have to do anything else. I could say var title equals await view model dot get name for location. And I'll say center dot latitude, center dot longitude, and there we go. At the same time, I no longer have to write any additional logic if I wanted to to actually add that pin to the map. So here, for instance, I can say, you know what? At the very end, once I have the name, I have the latitude and the longitude. So let's simply say await add coffee. I'll give it the name, I'll give it the latitude, and I'll give it the longitude. Perfect. So now this is really nice because previously my Android and iOS application, I had to not only access the shared code, come back to the UI, do some stuff, and maybe do something else. Now everything is right inside of here. I could do the same exact thing for Android. I could come in, I could say, you know what, there's this logic inside of here that I'm using, this geolocator. In here I could pull this code out and I could put it in there. And I, I could just write it right inside my Android application. So now, if I just do this on iOS, we could actually go ahead and run this one more time. I was going to build it up. And what's actually happening, what's important to know how Shared Project works, is that it's copying these files, essentially, at build time and compile time into my iOS application. So they get compiled in. I could go ahead and run this again on my iPhone simulator. In this logic, I could actually add a breakpoint in here to so using iOS. We, we add automatically for you this iOS and Android conditional compilation flags. You don't have to add it later. So I can come in. It's going to actually go out and load data again. There's our pins. can move this around. I live somewhere up over here. Add a pin. I'm inside my shared code. I have my iOS object. I can continue on. And it should go ahead and add my pin. There it is, Montlake. If I came back over into my Android application uh, over here, let's go ahead and load it up, my coffee app. I go ahead and load the coffee again. Now we've added that in. And sure enough, there it is. It's a random elementary school that happens to be there. Perfect. So that's really nice. There's three kind of approaches of sharing code. And what's nice is that if you're creating a portable class library or if you're creating a net standard portable library, those can easily be distributed across all the different platforms and up to NuGet. Now, as I mentioned, what's really important is that shared projects are really great for sharing code within a project. They're just code files, so there's no assembly generated uh, at all. So you can't take shared code projects and then share it up to 
NuGet, for instance. You're going to have to put that into a library. So if you're looking to redistribute to code, portable class libraries or net standard libraries, and then shared projects, great for sharing code. When you want to access some of those native features, you can. It's up to you. Whatever approach works best. So there you have it. Different approaches, sharing code across iOS, Android, and Windows. Until next time, I'm James Montemagno, and this has been The Xamarin Show.